Hey everybody, Eric Rennie here and welcome to the 49th episode of the RIT podcast. So in the Ontario election, we saw that the PCs were able to make inroads at the expense of the NDP, particularly in some of the strongholds, the industrial strongholds of the New Democrats. So it does seem to be a play by the PCs to go after the Labour vote. So to discuss that issue with me is Larry Savage. He's a professor at the Labour Studies Department at Brock University. Larry, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for having me. So... First of all, I think we should maybe set the table. There was a lot of focus during the election campaign on union endorsements, and the PCs were pretty keen on talking about which endorsements they got and how labor was coming over to them. Can you actually just tell us what those endorsements meant and and who was really being represented in those? Sure. So the Tories over the course of the campaign secured eight endorsements, uh, all from construction unions, uh, from the very outside of the campaign, from the Labour's International Union, which is the biggest of the eight construction unions, and then a bit of a slow drip of uh, endorsements throughout the campaign, which I think from smaller construction unions like uh, painters, sheet metal workers, uh, electrical workers, and in some cases they were only components of larger unions, Uh, But they really managed, I think, successfully to build this media narrative around momentum uh, and winning over some blue collar construction support. Because for the most part, the bulk of union endorsements did go to the NDP. Well, that's right. I mean, uh, the unions that endorsed Ford all combined represent less than 5% of the total union membership in the province. You know, in contrast, the NDP secured endorsements from the Canadian Union of Public Employees, uh, the United Food and Commercial Workers Union, the Amalgamated Transit Union, the Steelworkers, uh, the Machinists Union, the Ontario Public Service Employees Union, all much bigger unions that represent a much broader cross-section of the unionized workforce in, uh, in Ontario. But I think for the NDP, the problem is they're expected to win union support. And so it's not very newsworthy. And certainly the newsworthiness of the construction unions endorsing Ford certainly overshadowed any news uh, or good news that the NDP got through its union endorsements. What do we know, if anything, on the value of these? For example, if you have the steel workers or other uh, unions that represent industrial workers, rather than you know people who work as teachers or in the public service, do we do we know if a lot of those people would have followed their endorsements, or could their voting patterns be a bit more similar to some of those in some of those construction uh, unions that uh, the PCs did get support from? It's a really great question. I think historically. The, the value of union endorsements historically was money, that they usually came with donations. But of course, in Ontario, union and corporate donations have been banned since the 2018 election. I guess the 2014 election was the last time where you really saw unions and corporations donating to political parties. And so without the money, Uh, or the resources backing those endorsements, I think the parties are really looking for those unions to internally mobilize their own members to turn out and vote for that particular party. You know, historically, I know we've talked about this before, but uh, the um, union membership as a determination of your voting intention probably makes you slightly more likely than the average voter to vote NDP and slightly less likely than the average voter to vote PC. And it looks like that actually held in the last provincial election. And even though it looks like of all the parties, union members, both public and private sector, opted for the Tories, they did so, I think, on a lesser basis than the average voter did. So when we are talking about those fewer unions or smaller ones that did back the PCs, uh, there is something similar among them. As you said, they, they are the construction. Union. So what is behind that? Why are these some of these unions moving towards the PCs? I think demographically, construction unions are very different from the rest of the labor movement. For one thing, they're overwhelmingly male in their membership. They have a, I think, probably some cultural conservatism amongst their membership. And I think that um, the construction unions are also different from the mainstream labor movement and that they have a very pro-development mentality because their jobs depend on endless development. You know, if you're a construction worker, once you've built something, 
you've built yourself out of a job. And so construction unions have alliances with employers in the industry in the same in the in a very different way than unions uh, and their relationships with employers in other sectors of the economy. And I think we know we know that men favored Ford way more than women did. Uh, and we know that Ford's PCs also had a very pro-development policy outlook. And so that jived very well with some of the uh, priorities of construction unions. And it also helped that the Tories were in power and I think expected uh, people expected them to stay in power after the election. And construction unions are very pragmatic. They don't make ideological based decisions. They have no special sort of orientation towards the NDP as a labor party. And so I think they were looking out for number one at, through a transactional brand of politics. And Ford was willing to play ball in a way that some previous PC premiers never would have played ball with organized labor. So then would it be fair to say that this is the difference between say uh, a voting group that is more motivated by the fact that a PC government might have more construction jobs. So it's more to do with the employment opportunities rather than any particular labor legislation or labor focus from the government itself. It's, it's a little bit of both. It helps that Ford is dangling the carrot of infrastructure dollars, no question about it. But what distinguishes Ford from predecessors like Tim Hudak or Mike Harris is that those previous PC leaders loathed unions, vilified them, thought they shouldn't exist, had a very hardcore ideological opposition to them. You really didn't see that in Ford. You know, Monty McNaughton, the, the labor minister, was kind of an odd person to be the the uh, the spokesperson for bringing, uh, bringing unions into the tent because McNaughton himself, as an opposition member, was really promoting union busting American style right to work legislation when he was running for the party leadership. And he sort of uh, did a complete turnaround. They indicated that they were very open to having discussions with unions, something that Hudak and, and Harris didn't do. They froze out the union leadership from from important consultation processes. And Ford didn't go after the ability of those unions to exist. You know, Ford, uh, or Harris rather, rewrote labor laws to make it much more difficult to join a union and also applied that to the construction industry, which is why those construction unions were so anti-conservative in the first place. Once there was a detente though, and Ford signaled, hey, I'm not gonna screw around with your right to exist, your right to uh, represent your members' interests, and I'm going to dangle a few carrots uh, that'll guarantee some job security, that was enough to win them over. But when you're talking about the amount of people we're talking about, it's not a huge number, uh, but when you see the results, so they had uh, the two seats they picked up in the Windsor-Essex area, uh, they had the extra seat in Hamilton, though that might be a little bit further away from some of the industrial centers of Hamilton itself. And uh, you have the ones in Brampton, which I assume is probably a different factor than uh, anything to do with labor. And then Northern Ontario, gain in Thunder Bay, a gain in Timmins. What do you make of those gains and that narrative that we've heard from the media, but also from the PCs themselves who say that this was part of their goal? Um, what do you make of those flips that we saw from the NDP to the PCs? They're interesting flips. And I think the, um, the explanation is slightly different in each case. You know, in, in Windsor, certainly there were two incumbents who weren't running for the NDP, which has a slight factor. But I think Ford was very strategic in the case of Windsor in that he really pushed for investment in electric vehicles. Because Windsor is a big automotive center. The blue collar working class in Windsor, the biggest union in Windsor is Unifor, which didn't endorse Ford but didn't go at them as hard as they have gone after previous PC premiers in the past. And uh, I think a lot of those rank and file members would have found a home in the messaging around uh, blue collar workers and this, what uh, the media have dubbed this PC labor charm offensive. So I think that that definitely played a role in Windsor 
in Hamilton, it's a little different because of course that was Paul Miller's seat and he ran as an independent and helped peel off some of those votes. A lot of controversy there. I don't know if the NDP would have held that seat under different circumstances, but um, I think the Tories certainly did have some inroads uh, in the region, even if it wasn't enough to flip more than, than that particular seat. Uh, although they, it appears they, uh, they came very close in Niagara Centre, which is uh, a, a very long held NDP seat since, since back in 1975. So that would have been a, a major, major accomplishment. Brampton also is a working uh, class centre and it was a little different because those seats were never really NDP strongholds. The party had only picked them up in 2018. But I think people were surprised by how far the NDP vote dropped uh, in those Brampton seats and that they weren't even able to come close uh, in any of them. And so I think that, that was a real boon. And then in Northern Ontario, I think some of those races are far more localized and the local personalities matter. I think the Tory candidate in Timmins in particular was very popular. I don't think any of the polling aggregate data sort of picks up on that kind of stuff very well. Uh, and I think all in all, that the, the broader signal that those eight small construction union endorsements sent out symbolically was that worker opposition to the government was fading away. And in fact, some people were coming around and saying that Doug Ford was the premier for the little guy or the worker. You know, it's a little odd to say because, of course, he's the millionaire son of a former politician, but uh, he, he, he unquestionably has the reputation as someone who sticks up for the little guy. And I don't think the other parties did much to challenge that framing of the premier, frankly. And so I think the substance of those endorsements ladder, matters less than the symbolism of those endorsements. And the symbolism was worth its weight in gold for the Tories. So you mentioned what the other parties were doing. So we did see a, a post-election report from the NDP saying they were losing, I can't remember exactly how it was put, but maybe the working classes and they were getting the chattering classes. And one of the examples that has been looked at was Ottawa West Nepean, which the NDP was able to gain. It was one of their few gains, I think only one or two gains they made. And the, at least the, what I heard at some, in some explanations is that, you know, Ottawa West Nepean is a lot more public servants, people who are much more tied into politics, uh, probably fit very much the chattering class kind of definition. And it is kind of emblematic that the NDP is doing perhaps better in writings like that, but losing some of the traditional ground they've had. So has something happened with the NDP that is uh, problematic for them going forward if it's about holding what they have traditionally held rather than picking up a few extra seats that they're going to have to fight with the Liberals for now? There's this longstanding debate in the party about this battle over the soul of the party, right? If it's urban progressives or if it's the uh, working class who are really the base of this party and the two are sort of pitted against one another as if they can't uh, coexist in some kind of electoral coalition. The example of Ottawa West is interesting because it's one of the few NDP pickups, if it maybe it's the only NDP pickup, but I think there were six ridings in the entire province where the NDP vote share went up and Ottawa uh, West and Ottawa Centre were two of them. And I do wonder if that has to do with the convoy and uh, a very localized issue about how new Democrats were quite outspoken uh, on the side of residents in that particular case. I think Joel Harden and Ottawa Centre really outperformed expectations. And I think uh, he and Pazma in Ottawa West also really engaged in an organizing model for elections that you don't really see, which is door knocking, door knocking, door knocking, and less of an emphasis on flashy advertising. But some of the other ridings where the NDP vote share went up, like Scarborough Southwest or St. Catharines, they don't really fit the same demographic as Ottawa West. And so it's not clear to me that this narrative that the NDP gave up the working classes and, and embraced the chattering classes 
is something get, that can be applied across the board. I think it's more complicated than that. Okay, so then what is the challenge for the NDP going forward? Obviously, they're going to have a new leader coming. Uh, Joel Harden is one of the ones that seems to be potentially one of the candidates. You have uh, Marit Stiles has also talked about getting in. Uh, you know, she represents a downtown Toronto riding. Uh, it would depend on who ends up becoming the front runners, I suppose. And it could be a long time before we even know anything about what this race is going to look like. But it is a shift from Andrew Horvath coming from Hamilton, Howard Hampton coming from Northern Ontario. It seems like, again, I know it's just a narrative, but it almost seems like it's it's fitting, filling, uh, fitting into that narrative of going from, you know, the progressive urbanites and away from the, you know, the industrial worker base of the NDP. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the um, that's the argument, although, you know, Bob Ray also represented a downtown Toronto riding when he was leader and became premier and people weren't, you know, uh, accusing the NDP of being taken over by woke urbanites uh, in 1990. And so, you know, I think that explanation only goes so far. I also think the the pool of potential candidates of course, they're going to be drawn by urban centers because the NDP didn't win much outside of urban centers, except for in uh, in northern Ontario. Uh, and so, you know, that's that shouldn't surprise us in a way. It will be interesting to see, though, if anyone from outside the caucus um, takes a run. Uh, that'll be interesting to see. The other thing that's interesting about this NDP leadership race, and I know that you love leadership races is what makes this one different is that the Ontario NDP in its constitution still has weighted labor votes as part of the calculation. So 25% uh, of the, uh, the leadership votes go towards the union affiliates and 75% towards regular members. And that can have a dramatic, dramatic effect on the outcome. Uh, and so it'll be interesting to see if the labor affiliates to the NDP coordinate in a way that give them more leverage. Yeah, I, that's true. I had forgotten about that. But in part, the, you know, the NDP, the Ontario NDP hasn't had a leadership race for 13 years because uh, the federal NDP used to have that as well, but they dropped it for the last couple of ones. So I wonder if the Ontario NDP is going to make any changes either. Uh, that'll be one of the factors because the NDP does, unlike the other parties, uh, one member, one vote, aside from that extra labor vote. So that's another interesting factor uh, to come out, and I hadn't thought about that. But this race could end up running, you know, it might only get started in a little while. So, and it's likely that this debate is going to be pretty central to it, right? Whether uh, some of them are going to be saying that, you know, we the NDP has gotten away from from its roots, others are going to say that it has to go into a progressive direction. So it feels like this is going to be a debate that is going to come out in the, in the leadership race, whether or not it's a it's a real question, you know. Yeah, there's no question about it. I, but I also think there's just something about the NDP brand in Ontario uh, that the party has to overcome. And, uh, you know, and I don't think it's going to matter who the leader is, that there is um, where I think New Democrats, they are kind of, um, they're annoyed at the fact that between elections, the Ontario Liberals seem to increase in the polls at their expense for no apparent re the reason other than um, brand recognition, and uh, that the party is consistently lambasted as the tax and spend party, whether it moves to the left, whether it moves to the right. And so I think the base is demoralized in a way that they're not able to capitalize and, and move forward. And I think at the end of this election, I think people were, in fact, breathing a sigh of relief because they had expected to lose more seats than they actually did. It turned out that the worst night was for the Liberals, not for the New Democrats. And I don't think people expected that going into it. Yeah, certainly not to the extent that it was. I don't think anybody had them that low as eight seats. I was certainly surprised by that. So let's move. Let's let's go back to the PCs, though, because so the NDP is trying to figure out what to do going forward and how to counteract the efforts that the PCs have made for the PCs. Is this a lasting, is there something here that could be lasting for them? Or is it circumstantial to this election? Do the PCs, you know, they want to build this new coalition. And you listen to Corey tonight, for example, it sounds like this is a part of a bigger plan to make the PCs in a way, a little bit like the old big blue machine trying to be more pragmatic and, and gather as many different people as possible. Can the PCs keep this coalition together? 
I think the real question is, will the conservative movement allow it? Because, you know, Ford came at the unions with carrots in one hand and sticks in the other. You know, none of the labor charm offensive extends to public sector unions, right? There's still no love lost between the Tories and teachers unions or uh, healthcare workers, for example. And the bulk of the labor movement is actually made up of these public sector unions. I think the carrots, on the other hand, are all being given out to blue collar workers. And that's because I think the Tories are trying to drive a wedge between the union leadership and the membership, but also the broader working class. And so, you know, there's mumblings out there about whether the Tories will move to try to restrict the right to strike in the education sector for teachers. And are they gambling on this idea that the average construction worker doesn't like teacher strikes any more than, um, than the average non-union worker, right? I mean, these are the issues where I think the Tories are really zoning in on what matters to people and banking on a lack of solidarity between private sector union members and public sector union members. And this is going to be a huge strategic challenge for the labor movement as a political actor to try to overcome. There are clearly divisions in the movement after this election, even though they, they, they appear bigger than they actually are given the relative numbers, but the, it, there are divisions nonetheless. And there have always been divisions in the labor movement, but you just never saw so many unions embrace the Tories so openly. And uh, there are lots of angry people behind the scenes. There's no question about that. We mentioned them briefly. Do the Liberals have any game in this at all? It, it seems like they're not much of a factor. Well, this is the irony. The Liberals were laughing for 15 years because they had virtually every construction union in their back pocket through the Working Families Coalition, which essentially had been created by construction unions, but also was being funded by teachers unions and the Canadian auto workers and nurses. They were really going after the Tories with million dollar ad campaigns, multi-million dollar ad campaigns, attacking Ernie Eves, attacking John Tory, attacking Tim Hudak, and very effectively with some of their negative attack ads. And, uh, you know, I think the Wynn government really shot itself in the foot when first they moved to ban corporate and union donations because they were the biggest beneficiary of corporate and union donations. And they were also the biggest beneficiary of third party ad spending, which they also uh, curtailed quite a bit. And the Working Families Coalition lost interest in the Liberals very quickly after they were frozen out through those uh, changes to the Election Finances Act. They had a bit of a detente uh, with the Tories. And those construction unions really had no interest in the NDP because the NDP is viewed as the party that's least interested in uh, that pro-development mentality and seems to be the party most associated with the social justice issues that don't appear to resonate at all with construction unions. And so that shift from construction unions to the Tories, a lot of the media talked about it as the, as the NDP losing union votes to the Tories, but that's not what was actually happening. It was liberals who were losing uh, those union votes to the PCs because it was the construction unions that were writing big checks to the Liberal Party. And the Liberal Party now in Ontario can't seem to get any kind of play with a trade union unless they are identified as the strategic vote in, a, in an anti-PC strategic voting campaign. But, but as we know in this campaign, most unions who pursued those strategies like teachers unions, Unifor and the Service Employees International Union they mostly backed New Democrats because New Democrats came into the election with the most seats. Uh, and then after the results on election day, those, those, uh, those, uh, those unions did not pick many successful liberals. 
No, there, well, there weren't very many PCs that went down to defeat. So <laughs> if, if no, no PCs are defeated, the strategic voting options uh, don't work out very well. Um, we'll close on this because, you know, this was about Ontario and what happened in the Ontario election. But, you know, there's lots of cross-pollination between the Ontario and the federal parties, particularly, um, you know, with the NDP, which still has affiliations with the provincial parties. So looking at the results and the strategies that were employed by the NDP and the PCs, do you see any lessons, anything that applies to federal politics, not only in Ontario, but across the country? I, I think so. And, and to be clear, I think the federal Tories really laid some of the groundwork for McNaughton and Ford. Remember, you know, it was Aaron O'Toole who was giving his Labor Day message in 2020, you know, warning about uh, corporate barons and and uh, really holding up private sector unions in a, as an important component in, in society. I think one journalist joked that Aaron O'Toole sounded like he was running in the 1989 NDP leadership uh, convention, uh, which I thought was quite funny because a lot of the things he was saying were very uncharacteristic of conservative leaders. Now, for O'Toole, obviously it didn't work out, although, let's give him his due. He, he did win the most votes in that election, even though uh, they didn't win the most seats. And so that message, I think, did resonate for some people, but I think McNaughton and Ford really perfected it um, in, the, in the provincial election. They were really able to target in on a specific uh, group within the electorate and in specific seats where they thought it would make a difference. And I think that you'll see the federal Tories will pick up this torch and continue this voter segmentation or, uh, where they really, I think, pit public sector workers against public sector workers, but they are really gonna focus in on some of these cultural flashpoints to rein in some of these uh, manual blue collar workers who have this real sense, not imagined, but a real sense of um, economic insecurity and precarity and who see the solutions not in what the NDP is offering, but perhaps in the frames and strategies that the Tories are offering. Uh, and I say that being very skeptical of the frames that the Tories are using to offer uh, hope to working class communities and blue collar workers but I do think it's having an effect. And I think the results uh, of the Ontario provincial election demonstrate that they are having an effect. Yeah, and I think you can hear in Pierre Poliev's messaging, uh, there is a definite uh, targeting of those voters talk about gatekeepers and, and get, getting people uh, back to work or back control of their lives. He's definitely following in, the, the, in those footsteps, though perhaps in a, in a, in a more strident way than we, we hear from Doug Ford and Monty McNaught. Absolutely. I think um, Polyev's uh, populism will resonate with certain segments of the blue collar working class in Canada. There's no question about it. This is a huge problem for both the liberals and the new Democrats as they try to hold on to that base and also challenge the narrative that Polyev is putting forward, in particular, if they're not willing to embrace a sort of left populism to combat it. You know, think about the Bernie Sanders kind of politics that really resonated with working class voters in the United States. You really don't see the equivalent of that in Canada. I can't think of a single large political figure in Canada that has really um, taken on that approach. And, uh, and that's going to complicate things for the NDP and for the Liberals. Yeah, well, this Ontario election was not uh, the end of the story by any means. It just seems as one chapter in what is an evolving story on, on this kind of move that we're seeing with the Conservatives and New Democrats and the, the Liberals, both in federally and Ontario, trying to find some space in it. So, uh, Larry, I really appreciate you coming on and again to the podcast to talk about this. It feels like we'll have something to talk about again in the future when it comes to this issue. I look forward to it. Thanks to Larry Savage of Brock University for that discussion. And if you like that discussion, I hope that you will like this video, you will share with others that you think might enjoy it, and subscribe to this YouTube channel. Till next time, thanks for watching.